morning. It's great to see you, and happy Mother's Day to um, all of you mothers out there who have invested so much in the lives of your children, and then to all women, actually, who have uh, given so much and been role models, and so we just want, we honor you today and are glad that you're either joining us online or here in person this morning. We have been, as uh, Pastor Rick just mentioned, we've been in a series over the past few weeks entitled the Domino Effect series. And, and basically, just a little recap, if, you're, if you've not been with us or if you're just joining us now, um, the Domino Effect is all about, about the exponential power that was released after the resurrection and how that, impl the implications of that power for each and every one of us. And the example that you just saw so vividly made in that video, and maybe you're aware of this, but it's just, it's a good thing to be reminded of because it's in sync with what we've been talking about, is you take a two-inch domino, start with a two-inch domino, and that can topple over a four-and-a-half-inch domino, and then the four and a half inch domino can topple over a, a, um, a foot domino. And then you take that and that can topple over a two and a half foot domino. And then you advance it at the same level to domino 23 and that can topple over the Eiffel Tower. Now we're talking some movement, some momentum, right? And then you go to the 31st domino and that can topple over, that can knock something over 3,000 feet above Mount Everest. Imagine that. And when you make it to number 57, Domino 57, you're talking about approaching the moon. It's incredible to think about the potential. And what we're talking about in this series, as I just mentioned, is we're talking about the exponential potential through the power of the Holy Spirit that exists in each and every one of us. And so we've been talking about how uh, Jesus is the Lord of all creation. He created everything. He created you and me, and he created all of creation. And after the resurrection, Jesus began that new work of new creation. This world, and we, and we are living in what is commonly called the mopping up period. And so we're, we're not there yet, but Jesus is at work. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to each and every one of us through the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teaches us. You know, the resurrection caught everybody off guard. It caught everybody off guard. No one expected the resurrection. They saw, they saw him, Jesus, crucified, and they, they watched as his body was placed in that, that cave, and that huge, massive boulder was rolled in front of the, the doorway. It was final. It was done. This movement that Jesus had started was complete. And they, they were walking away, returning to their old life. And, and all of a sudden, it was the women, as we heard a few weeks ago, the women went to the tomb that morning, and they were the first ones who had discovered this exponential, amazing power of the resurrection of Jesus. How the stone, how the stone had been rolled away in that tipped off an amazing, an amazing movement that has forever changed the course of human history. And you and I are a part of that, that story. Last night, if, you were, um, if you're a Kentucky Derby fan, and um, I'm sure there's several of us, at least we've heard about it, unless you're living under some rock or something, but just an amazing, incredible Derby, right? And Anybody here, did anybody here bet on um, Rich Strike? I, yeah, exactly. Dion's saying, I wish. And if you don't know the story, if you have no clue what I'm talking about, 
the uh, rich strike was entered into the derby on Friday after another horse was scratched. So they, it wasn't even planning. To, it was kind of just a wild thing that the, the owner of Rich Strike did. And um, I was personally rooting for, when I looked at all the different charts and I had just tuned into it, not that I'm a big gambler or anything like that. In fact, I didn't gamble at all on it. But I was texting with our son, Connor, up in Jacksonville, and he was all into it. And, and so he was asking me who I was rooting for and um, who I would place my bets on if I was betting on. And so I, I went with, you know, where the um, odds were in their favor, Upper Center and, um, and Zandy. But Rich Strike wasn't even on the board. 80 to 1 odds. And it was amazing to see on that final turn as they were approaching the finish line. It was just incredible to see the power of that horse and how just the, um, the crowd went wild and, and he accomplished, that horse accomplished something that nobody was expecting. And it was the second largest payout in Derby history. You know, the Apostle Paul, we've been going through the book of Colossians, which is um, in the New Testament. And, and it comes just before, or it comes right after the book of Philippians and just before the book of Thessalonians. But what this book is all about, Paul writes this from a prison cell. He's going through these struggles in his own life, and he has the wherewithal within him to inspire this early Christian community that is going through their own disappointments, their own discouragements. You see, at one point in time, when they kicked off and launched that ministry, I'm sure, in Colossae, they were, um, they were seeing like lives change. They were excited. They were, they were just... Um, Excited, anticipating, what is God going to do this weekend in worship? And then something shifted. In fact, the, the city that they were in was kind of downgraded to a small town. People started to move. Maybe they went through a horrific thing that nobody could have planned for, kind of similar to what we've been through. And that really impacted that local congregation. They started, to, they started to drift. They started to lose the purpose of why they had gathered in the first place. They started to forget their mission. I'm sure we've, we've all heard that statement that vision leaks. And it truly does. Unless you're clear on your purpose and your mission, the tendency is going to be we're going to drift, and we're going to forget why we're here in the first place. And so the Apostle Paul, he writes from a prison cell, as I just said, and he writes these words of encouragement to this small, struggling congregation who is about ready to give up. They're just searching for anything that will get the, you know, they're throwing everything at the wall, waiting to see what will stick. And what they're doing is they're, they're starting to blend. They're starting to blend all these other religious practices of their day. And some of them, many of them, were not Christian. And so they're bringing them into thinking that maybe this is what we need to do. This is going to bring in more people here. And this is going to help us. J.D. Walt writes in his little book entitled by the same the devotional book, he says this, the Colossians, or the, the church at Colossae, they needed to make a decision. They needed to make a decision. Were they going to follow the countercultural message of Jesus or choose to live more like those in Colossae? Were they going to follow Jesus or was Colossae going to be the road that they followed. He goes on to say, blending into the ever-turning and twisting cultural landscape as a kaleidoscopic chameleon might do. Think about that. Have you ever 
seen a chameleon and how they change colors and um, we probably all heard that comment made about somebody that maybe we know or maybe even um, hopefully not about us but we've all heard that comment been made you know every generation every generation since the beginning of time has had to answer that same question will the way of Jesus lead us or will culture lead us? Will the way of Jesus lead us? Or will we baptize culture into our faith? And will culture lead us? So Paul writes these words from Colossians 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Hear these words this morning. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you, Paul says. For those at Laodicea, just a little pause. The Laodicean church that Paul is talking about here is the same church that is referred to. If you're familiar with uh, biblical stories and especially in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, John ref refers to to the church at Laodicea. And this church was a good, strong church. This church was known for many things. But one thing that John says in that word from Revelation is that church had become lukewarm. And he even makes this, this statement. He says, man, I wish God was wishing that you would be one way or the other, either you're going to be hot or, or totally sold out or cold. But I can't stand being lukewarm. In fact, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's what uh, John says, that God says. And so, so that's who he's referring to there. And for all who have not met me personally. You see, Paul was never at Colossae, at the city. My goal, my goal in writing this letter to you is that you may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that you may, may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I pray that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and make them pleasing pleasing to you. We live in um, bizarre times, oftentimes, and we need to be inspired. We need to be reminded of the purpose of the church, God. And so I pray that you would infuse us with that power that we're talking about over these 50 days, because you are alive and you want to rule in our hearts. You want us to be a vital ministry here in Melbourne. And so I pray that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and make them pleasing to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul was clear on the goal of following Jesus. He was clear. He was clear about it. He knew that if he could bring people together in communities of love, and encouragement, if he can encourage these people, come alongside them and just lift them up, then the good news of Jesus wouldn't be just informational. It wouldn't just be up here, but it, it would actually be transformational. It would move from up here down to, to the heart. And lives would be changed. It would be transformational. Paul knew it would tip from being a message, a message to revealing a mystery to becoming a movement. 
And that's the story that we are a part of, being a part of the church. So Paul writes to get them back on mission. Paul knows that vision leaks. He, he reminds them and us that it all begins with knowing Jesus. You know, I think we oftentimes in the church, I was raised in the church, and we just kind of assume that everybody knows Jesus. I'll just be honest. I mean, we just assume that, you know, it's... Um, so we get away from that call to Christ. And any time that Jesus went out, when he was on earth and in his ministry, he would go out and he would invite people to do what? To come and follow, right? He would provide that invitation that was personal, it was a personal invitation, and that's what the Apostle Paul is talking in to the, the church at Colossae, and he's reminding us that we need to get back to basis, basics <laughs> to invite people to, to have that personal encounter with Jesus, to open your hearts to Jesus. That's the secret. Jesus is the mystery that the Apostle Paul was talking about here. We can stop our quest for all the false treasures, all the things that, that capture our attention so many times and, and all the other stuff that goes with it. The unsurpassed riches that are found in Christ are available to each and every one of us. Jesus is why we exist as a church. Jesus is the reason that we have gathered this morning. Jesus told his disciples before he left them, he said this, he sent them out on a mission. He said this, it's known as the Great Commission. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. Stay on mission, Jesus said. Jesus came to start a movement of love and grace, not an institution of religious practices beholden to a certain political party or, or a certain sect or a certain race or nationality because the church of Jesus Christ that Jesus built and continues to build is made up of all people of all different backgrounds. Jesus is the mystery. But Jesus also, Paul, points this early church at Colossae to the way, the way to Christ is together. The way to Christ is together. And I think in an individualized culture like you and I have been formed in, in where it's all about my rights and it's all about um, personal individualization and, and finding yourself, I think that Paul's point here can get easily lost and we can get confused. Because when Paul identifies the mystery as Christ in you, which we talked about last week, what he is really saying scripturally is Christ in you all. I'm not from the South, so, um, but I'll use that Southern uh, you know, uh, term, you all. And because the you in scripture is oftentimes, most often, it is plural. It's not singular. It's not just individual. The New Testament rarely addresses me as an isolated, individuated, privatized person. And the same is true of you. Yes, God's love in Jesus is personal for us, but it's not individual. It's personal, but it's not individual. It's not just me and Jesus but it's Christ in us together to make a real difference in this community. 
Because if, we, if it's just me and Jesus, then I can just kind of hang out in my own little place and just kind of tune in to Jesus, do meditation or whatever, read scripture. And, but I'm never getting encouragement from others. And I would dare say, quite quickly, you'll lose that mission that you've been created to live out. Because you're, you're going to get discouraged along the way. And so the Apostle Paul is reminding this community of faith and us that the way is together. We're stronger together. We'll either stand together or fall together. But it's together that Christ has called us on mission, called us out on mission. A few years ago... I heard uh, a professor at a seminary, one of our United Methodist seminaries, she's just re recently, her name is Dana Roberts, and she recently wrote a book that I picked up because she was just a phenomenal speaker. And um, the title of the book is Faithful Friendships. And what she's done, she's focused solely on, throughout Scripture, how people were called into friendships. That's what the gospel is really all about. Bringing us out of our isolation and into friendships and, and, and having those relationships. Relationships are key to following Jesus and having good, healthy relationships. And so... In that book, Roberts writes, and she says, the language of friendship <clears throat> was used throughout all of Christianity, throughout all of Scripture, to make friends across boundaries was the goal. Christians saw that the love of God and the love of humanity could not be separated. Friendship with God and with each other is the way of salvation. You and I cannot know who we are outside of our relationship with God. And we can't know God apart from other people. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. So if I'm at odds with somebody, if I've broken a relationship with someone... Scripture teaches that we need to make that relationship right because that's a part of our journey with Christ. It's not just about me and Jesus. Because if I'm not reaching out and if I'm not making right relationships, then that's going to cause me to, to drift away from the mission. And it's going to cause you to drift away from the mission also person that Dion and I had the privilege to get to know when I was a student in seminary is um, the retired bishop from South Africa, Peter Story, and he was famous for saying this comment, and hopefully I'll get this right, but he says that um, when people would, would respond to following Jesus, when Jesus was walking on the earth, they would say, hey, I'm, I'm more than happy to follow you, Jesus, but he said, well, just make sure you're clear on this. If you're going to follow me, you have to be good with my friends too. And then the obvious question, he was asked many times, well, who are your friends? And Jesus pointed to the poor, the broken, the destitute, the sinners, those who the religious people didn't want to hang out with. They had written them off. Jesus was and is about bringing people together, together. Paul reminds this early church at Colossae and you and me that relationships are key. My goal, Paul writes, is that you would love, love one another, love one another. I was thinking about that portion of the text this morning. And thinking about Mother's Day, 2022. I was raised in a large family. One of ten kids. And so my mom was uh, busy, to say the least. <laughs> and and um, 
It was a lot of crazy, crazy times at home. But you know what? Um, I was, as I was thinking about it and preparing for this message this morning, I thought about different qualities that I saw in my mom and I see in my mom. She's 87 now, and my mom and dad are thankfully both still alive and with us, and they live up in Michigan. And, but just the, um, the sacrificial love, willing to kind of um, give up on maybe something that she wanted for herself so that she could pour into us. That's one of the things that I saw in my mom. And, and a self-giving, self-sacrificing love. A love that shows up and stands up even for you and defends you even when maybe she doesn't understand or maybe she's um, aggravated with you about <laughs> whatever choices you've made. But she's there for you. A love that embraces and lifts you up and encourages you. She was certainly not perfect. But she showed us what it means to love. She showed me what it means to love. So many stories of faithful women down through history. Faithful women who have, who have invested in persons' lives and made a difference. I'm proud to be a part of a denomination that lifts up women at all levels. And my wife is um, a clergy person. And so she, she's joined with me in ministry on this crazy journey. And um, maybe you would like to talk to her about that afterwards. Uh, about, but, um, and what a role model she's been for our girls and for so many. It's no news that we live in, we find ourselves living in times of great division. We're divided in our politics were divided um, in the church, even. This last week in the United Methodist Church, in our own particular denomination, just a week ago, the new expression of Methodism known as the Global Methodist Church launched, and many of you probably have read about that or heard about that, or maybe you haven't at all. And so, um, so we're divided as a, as a church, and we're going through division. And I prefer to use the word multiplication because instead of getting bitter or getting caught up in the division and getting angry and all those kind of things, I choose to reframe it and look at it. You know what? God can use the new denomination, God can use the continuing Methodist church, God can use and God will use each and every one of us as we, as we stay in right relationship with him. But if we get sucked into just criticizing each other and, and being mean-spirited towards each other and just uh, airing our dirty laundry and having these fights online and social media, it will destroy the church and it will destroy the witness of this local church if we get sucked into that because it's all about coming together. In the next few weeks moving ahead, um, you're going to be hearing about many different opportunities to locally to invest in. Because I think all, all ministry is really local. Just like all politics are local, right? And we're called to make a real difference to make this community a better place. To come alongside people who are struggling, people who are wrestling, people who have uh, given up on faith. And connecting all people to Jesus. This past week, Dion and I had, um, we were invited to 
Brevard Justice Ministries up at Sun Tree United Methodist Church for a uh, Nehemiah gathering. And uh, when we arrived, we didn't really know what to expect. I kind of had an idea because I'm familiar with the organization. They do a lot of good work around, throughout the community here in Brevard County. And so when we arrived at the church, there were people from all different denominations, all different churches in the local community. Over 300 people had gathered there in Sun Tree United Methodist Church's sanctuary. And we had all gathered there from our various perspectives. I'm sure there was a wide plethora of politics uh, represented in the room, many different people from different cultures and backgrounds and all of that kind of stuff. But we gathered in that room, in their sanctuary that night, for this Nehemiah project to address to address affordable housing in Brevard County. And as we listened to the various presentations, we were asked to continue to respond with these words. Everybody would shout it out. I mean, they got people fired up there, the people who were leading. But everybody would shout out, everyone deserves deserves a safe home. Everyone deserves a safe home. And then they would give us some statistics about how, how rents have been going through the roof for people. And people are finding themselves homeless, living in their cars with kids and, and living in the woods and living in parks, wherever they could go. They shared with us in, um, up in Vieira how Buses, school buses, were picking up kids in parks to take them to school. And you think about the way of Jesus and what Jesus calls us to be about. I mean, oftentimes we think, that, well, that's somebody else's problem. I'm just focused on just my own thing here. But we were inspired that night to, to really get on board. So I'm planning for, for this congregation to be a part of the solution. And getting on board and addressing affordable housing. We've already made contacts, in fact, um, with the various commissioners from Brevard County. And none of them showed up. The organization had made contacts with them and none of them were there and so they made that apparent in the um and it was it was interesting but um dion uh afterwards she had sent one of the commissioners she was so moved that she sent one of the commissioners an email and said you know what's the deal why weren't you at this gathering you know i represent i'm the district superintendent and i represent 18 churches in brevard county and so United Methodist Churches, and we would like you to tune into this, this challenging problem and be partner with us in addressing it. And so they immediately got back to her. It was great. And so, um, so it's just uh, we want to come alongside with those in positions of power and to really raise the bar, and join with other churches in this community in making a real difference, a positive difference in Jesus' name. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about that, and if you'd like to be involved in that, I'd love to hear from you personally. Some people have already reached out and want to be involved in that. We want to be faithful to our mission here at First Church, which is to love God, to love people, and to change the world. So just to wrap things up, I'd like to end with just a couple questions for you. What do you think? What do you think the implications are for you when you think about Christ in you all versus Christ in you? What are the implications? Just think about that. And then the second question is, how do we move from a me-centered faith to a we-centered faith?
to come together to really live out that exponential potential that we have experienced through the resurrection of Jesus. Would you pray with me? God of hope, God of new beginnings, we come to you today. Not because we are somehow closer to you than somebody else. Or that we have everything all figured out because we don't. We have our questions. We have our doubts. We have wandered away from your love in so many ways. I have. We all have. So God, we just pause in this moment and of quietness and ask that you would forgive us on this mother's day may we honor those who have invested so much in our lives who have poured into us courage and hope forgiveness grace love So Jesus, as we are about to come to this table of grace, may we open our hearts to you, maybe for the first time. And may today each one of us walk out of here inspired to, to make a difference in our community. To move out of the navel-gazing that is so easy to, to get wrapped up in and to to allow our hearts to be broken for what your heart breaks for. And so, come Lord Jesus, we know that you're here and you've invited us to this table of grace. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.